So let's now take a more detailed look at Unix process creation. We've already seen in the lecture that there are two necessary steps to create a process in Unix that executes another program. So the first step is to create an identical copy of the process that wants to execute another program using the fork system call. And we've already seen that this fork system call creates a copy of the address space. So essentially after we executed fork, we still have forks address space as a parent process here. And then we'll have the child process space here as an almost identical copy of the process space of the parent here. And when we execute exec afterwards using this uh, related system call, then our child process overrides its own address space with code and data of another program. So this means the child process remains with the same process ID and input output and so on. It just changes its complete memory contents. And this is, for example, what happens if you execute an ls command on a Linux shell. So the shell, like bash, forks itself first. So we have a child shell and this child shell then uses exec to, for example, replace its own contents with the contents of the ls binary on disk somewhere and then starts this ls binary and then this ls binary finally terminates. And as we've seen, the shell usually waits for the child process to terminate and then it just continues running in its own address space. So how does fork look in detail? So let's say we have a process here with process ID number 25, and this has its address space here. So it has a text segment data and stack and some other process state like its current stack a pointer or its program uh, counter and stuff like this. So this process communicates with the Unix kernel using system calls, for example, potentially using a different additional library like libc. And this process has its own set of resources, which it has allocated, which were provided by the kernel. So this is communicated by the kernel. And it also has potentially its own sets of files in use, so open files, which can read or write. So uh, let's uh, assume our kernel does the following. It executes a fork system call, returns, uh, it gets the uh, process ID returned uh, as a uh, of the child returned uh, as a consequence of the fork call if it is the parent process and if it uh, is returned as zero, as we've seen here before, it just executes the child code and exits. Otherwise, it's a parent code which can do a wait for the process ID of the child that was returned. So when fork is executed, we jump into the Unix kernel and the Unix kernel now copies all of this address space for process ID 25 into a new process, which has the ID 26. So process ID 26 is a copy of the process with process ID 25. So it holds the same resources, same permissions and the same files and well, it has a copy of that address space here and both are inside of the fork system call now. So we made two processes out of one. And so what happens now is that when our parent process and our child process eventually return from fork, that's the major difference they have. That is the return value of the fork system call. So in our parent process, as we've seen, we are returned the process ID of the newly generated child process, so 26 here. Whereas in our child process, we are returned to zero because we can figure out our own process ID using the get bit system call. So what we do here is since CPID is 26 here, we skip this if section here because this is only reserved for our child and continue executing at this line of code here for our parent and eventually do a wait for our uh, child process to terminate. Whereas our child process continues to run on the right hand side here. So it enters this if block here because it was returned to zero here, can run its child code and eventually perhaps exit without doing an exec or with doing an exec. So process ID 25, our parent process, uh, waits for the termination of process ID 26 because that was what was returned and that's what we pass as parameter to wait. 
and eventually process ID 26 exits here and terminates. So now uh, what happens is that the memory mappings and contents of process ID 26, our child process, are removed from memory. All these associations to resources and files are also removed. So no more program on the right hand side. But now this information that we called exit here in our child process, this is a, a system call or as you see the library call that actually resolves to the underlying exit system call. So this is passed to the Unix kernel and the task of the Unix kernel is to inform the parent process of our recently terminated child process that the child process is no more. So it's eventually this wait call can return and it's uh, indicates now, okay, your process with your process ID of 26 that you've passed. This has now terminated. So when we call exec in our child process, we've seen that the memory contents of the current process are replaced by the sections of another executable elf file, which is passed to exec as a parameter. And we've already seen this is the only method to start a new program in Unix since fork just creates identical copies of an existing process. So what happens when you use exec, when you call the exec uh, system call, is that the kernel opens the executable file and then the elf loader inside of the kernel loads the text and data segments. Uh, LDSO is actually mapped inside of the address space of our executable and LDSO checks for the required shared libraries. As we've seen, we have, we have found the way to figure this out using the LDD tool. So LDSO does something similar. It tries to find all the shared libraries on the disk, loads them into this special address space for shared libraries. And then our operating system creates a stack segment and a heap segment and also BSS in memory because these are not contained in the ELF file. And finally, our kernel now jumps to what's indicated as the entry point in our ELF file. So the very first byte of the first instruction of our program. And this looks like this. So we have our child process here and now our child process again, as we've seen before, is an as if block here. So what does our child code do? Now let's say our child code executes foo uh, for a real exec function. Uh, you might need to pass additional parameters like arguments as we've seen before. So uh, essentially uh, the system can call, now, uh, well the system call exit, exec, excuse me, is now called in our if block. So uh, this changes mode to the operating system, so to our Unix kernel. And then our Unix kernel figures out, okay, if it's possible to exec that program, so it checks the parameters first, is there an executable file foo that can be reached and is it allowed for the user to execute it? But if everything's fine, then our kernel simply zaps the whole address space. So the whole memory content of our process ID 26 here. So there's a short moment probably when we don't have any valid memory contents. So what the kernel now does, it opens and loads the executable file foo from our file system and then it replaces the memory contents of process ID 26 by the segments of foo as we've seen before. So starting from the beginning, from our text segment, data segment, and so on. And finally, after it has successfully loaded all the new memory contents in this address space and allocated all the allocatable segments like stack and BSS from scratch, then it actually starts to execute the first instruction of our new executable foo. So the first instruction, which is located at the address that our entry point address points to, then it executes the program until this program uh, itself uh, executes an exit system call. So when we start the new program after exec, the question is, where does it start? We know when we create a process using fork, uh, we have an almost identical copy of the parent process and both process uh, parent and child continue after the return from the fork call. Now, where does a newly loaded, so an exact program start? Because we have no more previous program code available, we need to start from the beginning. So you might say, okay, yeah, the very first instruction I'm executing in the C program is the first instruction in main. Not quite. That's the first instruction you see executing. 
But as we've seen before main is called, a number of things have to be initialized before a program can be successfully run. And this includes, for example, the setting of the contents of the BSS segment to zero values, because that's what our compiler assumes for variables contained in the global BSS segment. So this is a diagram of Linux program startup here. So our loader essentially uh, calls a underline start function. And this underline start function actually calls a function libc start main. So we see we do a startup using our libc. And libc start main calls a number of init functions here. So libc csu init, and this calls a number of additional functions here. And then finally, well, it calls our main function. And eventually, of course, we call exit here. And even when we call exit, our program is not completely finished. We've seen that exit needs to do a number of cleanup things. And we can additionally uh, also specify a number of functions to be called at the exit of a program in order to clean up after our program. So we have certain at exit functions that can be called. And finally, we can call something like destructors to remove uh, data elements from memory. So there's a lot of things happening before our first instruction in main is actually executed. So let's take a look at a very simple C program. And that is probably one of the most simple C programs you can imagine. It just has a function main that gets no parameters. Uh, by standard, it should return an integer. and doesn't contain any instructions here. Now you can compile this. This is a valid C program, obviously. It doesn't do much uh, useful uh, stuff, but still, it's a valid C program. And if we compile it, not only with our standard parameters here for output program name and so on, but adding the dash g parameter, we tell our compiler to include additional so-called debug information, debug symbols in the ELF file. And uh, then we could take a look at the contents of our ELF file in our disassembler here. So a disassembler is part of the GNU bin utils. So a disassembler essentially uh, just uh, tries to convert the binary instructions as part of our text segment here, so what our compiler and linker generated, back to human readable assembler code, so these mnemonics here for the instructions plus register names. And so when we dump the uh, executable code of our program, we see there is something. And we've seen we start at a function called underline start. This is located at that address here, and this contains uh, this set of addresses. And well, it does a number of things here. Uh, we don't go into details on this here, uh, but you see it does some pop and push stuff. So it does stuff on the stack somewhere. And finally down here, it calls our function libc start main, which is somewhere in its virtual address space. And this is not supposed to return. So if this eventually returned this libc start main function, then we execute a halt statement. Halt just halts our CPU and terminates our process. Of course, the CPU is not immediately halted because the operating system regains control. But this avoids running into accidentally into code when a call to libc start main should return uh, unexpectedly. So this is going much more into detail than you really need to know for operating systems. But I thought let's go to the real hardware here. So uh, again, we take a quick look at the x86 architecture. So we take a look at 32-bit x86. And we have registers that are in general 32-bit wide. These are called EAX, EBX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. Uh, you can also access them as 16-byte wide registers here called AX, BX, CX, DX. And you can also access the upper or lower half of these registers. So this is all very prehistoric and uh, still relates to the original Intel 8086 processor from uh, around 1978, uh, which was only a 16-bit machine, which should be able to run on 8-bit data types. And then with the 386, they extend registers to 32-bit. And of course, with current x86 processors, you have 64-bit wide registers, which are then called RAX, RBX, and so on. So if you find this very confusing, don't worry, it is. Uh, in addition to these general purpose registers A, B, C, D. Uh, we have some special registers like the stack pointer ESP, the base pointer EBP, which points to the current stack frame of your function that you're executing. And for special uh, operations that can, for example, copy memory or strings, you have a source index and destination index registers. 
So in theory, all machine instructions can operate on all of these four general purpose registers, which is not a lot, especially for writing compilers and stuff. But there are some uh, exceptions, unfortunately. But if we wanted to discuss this, I need to talk another three or four hours about Intel Assembly. And I must tell you, it's not a lot of fun. So uh, we can look and try to figure out what our start function actually does. And our start function is uh, essentially split into three parts. So part one here initializes our stack. So first it uses this very strange construction to set our EBP register to zero by XORing it with itself. So an XOR just sets a bit to zero when both bits are zero or one. So if we XOR a variable with itself, all of our bits are set to zero. Then it fetches a register ESI from a stack that was initially set up already by our kernel. It copies our stack pointer from a register ECX, uh, so that was passed by the kernel already. And then it does some alignment here by just mapping out the least significant four bits of our stack pointer to ensure that our stack starts at a multiple of 16 bytes, so at an address evenly divisible by 16. So now part two of our executable starts, and this actually saves parameters for our libc start main function on the stack. So it pushes remaining registers like the AX register, ESP, the stack pointer, and the DX register. It saves a number of addresses on the stack. So for example, an entry point address uh, and a number of additional registers which might be used. And finally, it calls our libc start main function. And if this should ever return, which it shouldn't, the processor is halted just to be sure that we have a deterministic behavior of our program. So what do all these parameters for libc start main actually do? If we take a look at the prototype of libc start main, and that's great because it's all open source, so this is part of our GNU libc source code in Linux in a file csu libc-start.c, we see it has a large number of parameters. So uh, First, it gets a function pointer passed here. So this is a function pointer in C syntax, which means it's just the address of our main function here. Then it gets passed the argument counter, and then it gets passed the argument string array, so a pointer to an array of strings, and a number of additional function pointers, so constructors and destructors for this program, um, and additionally, uh, function pointers for a destructor of the dynamic linker, so uh, when it needs to unload shared libraries. And finally, it gets information about the stack pointer. So you can compare the values pushed to the stack as parameters to libc start main with our prototype here. And we've seen our next step is that our libc uh, calls our main function. So we've seen our prototype for main has in general three sets of parameters. So the first is just an integer telling us how many arguments are contained in the following array of strings that's called argv. And our environment pointer, which is optional, contains the shell environment, which is also an alterminated list here in the form a equals b, so name of an environment via variable like path equals uh, some value for this. And we've already seen argv of zero, so the very first element of our argv string array uh, contains the name of the executed program itself, so the program knows how it was executed. And so we can print the environment variables, for example, using this piece of code here. So we now declare our main function to take an argument counter, a array of strings called argv, which are the arguments here, and another array of strings that has wrapped around again here, uh, containing the environment. And now we can just walk through this by dereferencing it once. So this gets us the first string and then the second string and so on just continuing and just print the contents of this. And afterwards, we just increase, increment the pointer to the next environment variable. And when we do this, and for example, uh, we can also, of course, do this for arc v, and we can also print arc c. Uh, we can export an environment variable called var, and which has a content fasl as a string. And then we can call our program, uh, and this program uh, with these parameters one, foo, and blah, uh, tells us it has four arguments because the first one is our program name, that's the next one, that one, and the last one here. So our argv consists of the strings dot slash proc, which is exactly the name you use to call it. Then a string, which is one, so just a digit one, 
and of course the terminating zero again, another string foo, finally a string blah, and finally, to indicate it's the end of the argv array, just a null pointer here. So a null always terminates these lists of uh, arguments or environment variables here. And your nv uh, pointer contains uh, a string var equals fuzzle, so exactly what we did here on our shell, and a large number of additional shell variables like our path, for example, which are set automatically or by shell scripts or whatever you could do before on the shell, and this also terminates by a final zero. So on 32-bit x86 parameters are passed on the stack in the opposite order of the function signature. So in our start function here, we've seen we pass a large number of parameters on the stack, which are all the parameters uh, that uh, are, well correspond to the parameters of our prototype for libc start main. So, uh, well, uh, we have a number of arguments and they're pushed in the opposite order of the function signature. So the first uh, element pushed is the last element actually of the function signature. And you see the last thing we push here is the first parameter, which would be the address of main. The ESI is passed by the kernel, which is the argument count, so just an integer. ECX is the pointer to our argument array here. Then we have the address here to our init function and to our fini function, so to our destructor functions here. And the same for the destructor function for our dynamic linker here. And finally, we push our stack pointer here and AX is actually unused, I think. So libc start main eventually calls our main function and it takes care of linking and loading. It takes care of some security uh, concerns when we have so-called set UID or set GID programs, which uh, try to change the owner of a program to someone else. This is, for example, used for the programs that uh, enable you to change your password, because obviously you're not allowed to read or write a system password file. Uh, so because, uh, well, this would enable you to uh, read other people's passwords or to even change other people's passwords. So a program like passwd that changes the password needs to run with system administrator, so in Unix terms, root permissions. And this is one sort of these set UID programs where the code should be tightly controlled in order to only allow the intended functionality. Uh, libc start main additionally starts up threading. So if we have pthreads libraries, uh, it would initialize all the threading code. It registers uh, the, our program and the runtime loader arguments uh, that are run at the exit of our program. Uh, so our own uh, cleanup routines and the loader's cleanup routines would work. It calls some init argument if we have it, and then it finally calls main with argc and argv passed to it. And we also have the environment, which essentially in, in this implementation is a global variable here. And when return main, uh, when main returns and doesn't call exit itself, then libc start main also takes care of calling exit for us. So we have a ordered cleanup of all of our program resources and so on. So even if you write a main that just ends or just uses a return, then this means that the exit system call is then called automatically by libc start main. If you do it yourself, well, then you won't return from that exit call. So uh, you'll end somewhere here in main with cleaning up after yourself uh, on your own. So uh, we've seen there's something called a C program constructor, libc CSU init constructors. Wait, that's no C++ code. So, of course, C++ has constructors and destructors for objects, but this is C code. But even C code programs have functions to initialize and remove data elements. And these are actually uh, contained in this libc csu init and fini for finish constructor and destructor calls. So this would, for example, initialize some of these arrays here. So that's uh, additional stuff that goes on deep below your program, which usually as a programmer, you're absolutely not concerned with. So uh, 
Whenever we call this, we've seen this calls an init function here. So init also does some useful stuff. And again, of course, we can look at this in the source code file elf-init.c. And this init function here prepares global information. So it has some pointers to global tables so our program can figure out where our global variables are. If we want to get information about the runtime behavior of our program, we could uh, ask our operating system to optionally start a profiler. This is also done by init. Uh, if we have uh, exceptions that could happen, it would save information that the exception handlers can use to set up a context. And it would call global constructors, for example, also for C++. And finally, our libc start main calls our own main function, the one we've written and that was compiled as uh, the consequence of us calling GCC and so on. So. Uh, calling our main function just uses this pointer that we've passed as the first parameter to our startup function and it uses this function pointer uh, that was passed to it to call our main function and as we've seen it passes argc, argv and the environment pointer to our main function on the stack. So this is essentially the code implementing it in a bit of an older libc version. Nothing fancy, just call the function and it calls main which is a function pointer but uh, you, we can use a function pointer just as a, as a symbol here, and it passes argc, argv, and the environment here, which has a bit of magic to uh, actually use the right addresses here. And well, that's all, and our program is finally running, but it's a bit more than you've probably expected. So yeah, that was it. That was our in-depth look at how Linux manages processes and how processes are started. Yes, to uh, repeat it again, this lecture eight here is not relevant for the exam. So you don't need to know the details, but I hope it, if you looked at the, uh, the videos here, it helped you to get a deeper insight if you're interested in this. Uh, this is stuff uh, you need to be concerned with when you're doing certain things on the compiler and operating system side. So when you really dig deep, there's much more below all of this infrastructure than you actually see as a programmer. So again, the operating system as it should do, manages to create abstractions here, which make life easier for you as the programmer. Uh, but of course, if something would go wrong in all of these parts, then this would be very difficult to debug. So essentially the system developers here for our operating system kernel, for our libc, for our compilers, really need to take care that everything works and works together. So here's uh, finally some references. So we can take a look at the ELF standard here. Uh, to get more details of, uh, about what an ELF file looks like. There's a very nice book which was uh, published freely by John Levine. It's a bit older called Linkers and Loaders and you can download the PDFs at that URL here. Uh, there's additional information, for example, for working with libraries and the linker. There's a document by Ulrich Trepper, who was the glibc maintainer for many years on how to actually write shared libraries. Uh, there's uh, this question of how long does a linker actually take to resolve all the symbols. So there's an interesting article on Linux Weekly News, that's one uh, online newspaper about Linux, on optimizing linker load times. If you're interested in AB conventions, so in which order are parameters passed on the stack, for example, when you call a function, uh, there's interesting documentation here. And in general, uh, there's uh, quite a good book uh, on Unix programming by Eric Raymond, The Art of Unix Programming. And if you really want to have a very close look at what goes on on the stack, there's a special book on this by Giuseppe Catalo, Di Catalo, called Stack Frames, A Look from Inside, which definitely even contained more information than I wanted to know about stacks. So that's all for this lecture. This was a bit longer. This provided more details, but if you're not really completely interested in this, feel free to skim it, just go over it and see maybe this detailed introduction into what fork and exec does uh, helps you to understand this procedure in Unix or Linux better. But as I said, if you don't understand all the details, don't worry. If you want to understand more details, let us know and we can try to provide you with some more information. That's all for today. Thanks for listening and until next time.